You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am your host, Summer Gilbert, and I am the Director of Marketing and Branding here at Pacific Companies. Today on the Doc Lounge Podcast, we're talking to Dr. Kate Schmitz. She is practicing in Washington State, and she's going to give us a rundown on her journey through medicine, why she chose to do family medicine, what her focus is right now as a physician, and then she's also going to give advice for med students who are looking into going the family medicine route. So without further ado, here is our episode with Dr. Kate Schmitz. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, So let's start with why you went into medicine and where you did your training. I, well, I went into medicine. um, Primarily, I was motivated by the idea of working with um, severely underserved populations in and outside of the United States. I was looking at doctors with orders as an organization that I thought did really good work. Um, And then through the course of my training, I became aware of (laughs) how much need there is in this country as well. And so I've primarily worked in this country, but I have um, done medical trips outside of the United States. And I did my training for medical school. I was in um, the American University of Antigua, which is in uh, the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. I was on the island for 15 months. And then we had a transitional semester in the United States. uh, And then you sit for the first part of your licensing exams. It's USMLE step one. Um, And once that was completed, I went to Puerto Rico for almost a year. Mm -hmm. For my third year of um, medical school, which is, that's when clinical rotations start is in the third year. Mm -hmm. So I did, I did that in Puerto Rico. And then I was in uh, New York city, kind of on the border of, uh, Brooklyn and Queens. Where did you find the most underserved populations? Uh, ev- everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't say there. Uh, there, I mean, there were differences. Um, mm-hmm. Hospital in Puerto Rico would lose power more frequently. I mean, they had generators, but that was sometimes a problem. And that wasn't really something that I saw in the U.S. But yeah, across the board, there are so many underserved people. Mm-hmm. In, in and out of this country. And I, I was in hospitals and settings that were primarily, you know, serving underserved populations always. Uh, so I, w- I would say everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then for my residency, I, I moved to Washington State uh, and I was in um, Central Washington Family Medicine Residency Program, which is uh, the main program is in Yakima. And I was in Ellensburg on the rural track but I rotated in both of those places. So I was traveling back and forth. Washington is beautiful from what I've known. I have never been, but I've heard Mm. it's very beautiful. It is beautiful. It's vastly different from uh, one side of the state to the other because of the Cascades. So Mm -hmm. like Western Washington is very wet and lush and green and Eastern Washington is very dry. And uh, it's like a high desert sort of climate. So it's very, very, very cold in the winter and extremely hot in the summer. Yeah. (laughs) And there's not that many trees, but, um, but yeah, it's a beautiful state, very diverse. I love Western Washington. Yeah. I love the water and the trees. So that's where I live now. During your rotation, did you find yourself just getting more and more comfortable with family medicine? Is that, is that why you chose that route? Well, I mean, the path to residency, you almost have to know ahead of time going into it what you want to do, because the way that you want to structure your clinical rotations and the experience that you need to have and the letters of recommendation that you need, like, for example, if you want to go into orthopedic surgery, you need to do those rotations first early on in your third year so that you can have your application ready. Yeah. Um, because it's such a rigorous, very, very, very competitive and very, um, you know, that just the timeline is so rigid <laughs> Yeah. that you, you can't just decide at the end of your fourth year that you want to go into orthopedic surgery. And yeah. like, you, you already have to have that application done unless you want to take a year off you know, Mm -hmm. but I was attracted to primary care. I knew that I would go into primary care just because I wanted to be able to serve the most people with the most commonly diagnosed problems that needed the most help. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, primary care for me felt like the most sensible way to do that. Do you work with all ages? Um, not anymore. I used to, uh, I kind of pieced out of corporate medicine. That world is not for me. So now I, I just work with our, uh, free clinic here in town. And then, um, there's a medication buprenorphine, or some people know it as Suboxone for people who are, um, struggling with opiate use Mm -hmm. substance use disorder. And so I, I work with that population. Oh, wow. Good for you. Yeah, it's very, very rewarding. And then it's a very high need. Like we need we need more people doing yeah. willing to do that work. Um in a low barrier setting. I work in a low barrier clinic, meaning that for example, if someone is still using crystal meth, we're not gonna cut off their spock zone. Or if, you know, they don't come on the day that they're supposed to come, we'll still see them on a walk in basis. Like we yeah. see walk ins. We we try to kind of schedule people if we can, but you know, we'll see anyone who comes in during yeah. the hours that we're open anytime. And, um, there, are, there's funding for people who can't afford their medication or yeah. if they don't have insurance and there's ways around that. And we try to reduce barriers. And I think that, you know, that's been really helpful. Our patients are very grateful. I can see um, that being really rewarding, but then also sad at the same time. It's true, but you see it across the board in all of medicine. Yeah, true. <laughs> there are many people who are diabetic and have high blood pressure and many problems yeah. who do not do what mm-hmm. I think they should do. <laughs> yeah. Well, that leads me into my next question. So what do you like the least and the most about family medicine? Like the least, I think, I mean, this is kind of a larger issue, but what I like the least is the dysfunctional nature of our healthcare system generally (laughs) Mm -hmm. and what a mess it is. Um, I guess, but if I was just going to focus on the specialty of family medicine, what I like least is that family medicine um, is in a tough position because the salaries are the lowest and the workload is often the highest. And what you're asked to do is often far more than what a specialist Mm -hmm. is asked to do. Um, and, then and the, the demand is highest. The, the, the demand is high. Mm-hmm. So for example, you might, many clinics will book patient appointments in 15 minute increments. And when they're counting that 15 minutes, they're starting from the moment that that person's name is called. And then it generally takes 15, 20, sometimes 25 minutes to actually get them in the room and do their vital signs, and read their medications and et cetera. And so then by the time the doctor or the provider it's in the room, the visit is over and maybe it's been over for 10 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. But there's the patient has a problem that they came in for, and then maybe they have two or three more problems (laughs) that become apparent during the course of the visit, or maybe they have two or three things that they want to talk about. And, and that doesn't happen to specialists, you know, they get the one hour time slot and, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's easier. It's easier to focus on one thing. And, and people know that, um, when they're going into their training. So it's sort of like a, it's a very dysfunctional sort of model. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I don't know. I don't see any like good solutions because we just, we just have such a mess. It's, mm, I can yeah. talk for a long time about that. <laughs> well, I would say, I would say the rewarding thing that you've come across, you know, is what comes out of the patients, you know, treating mm-hmm. those patients and, and having that success and Yes, there's many values. And also, <laughs> the specialists often do not communicate with each other or the family practice doctor. And so then there's like no one sort of driving the train. And then mm-hmm. that becomes a mess often for complicated patients. That can be very, very challenging. Or what they want will conflict. You know, what the nephrologist wants will conflict with what the cardiologist wants. And they don't talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And and then they also often don't talk to the patient. They'll decide something and then nobody will tell the patient what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> I would see that over and over and over again. It would drive me crazy. Um, but, you know, yes, there's many, many valuable, meaningful moments and rewarding things. And I love my, I love my, my job now and my work-life balance is amazing, but in a unique situation and most people don't get to where I'm at. I, I work like less than 10 hours a week now. So. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> so, so I have lots of energy to give yeah. when I show up and, and that's fine. But I was very burned out. Mm-hmm. I just, um, I work like two shifts a week with, uh, 
the Olympia Butte Clinic and um, I volunteer with the free clinic and yeah. those shifts are about three hours each. Yeah. Um, but I have an interesting question for you. If okay. you had to go back and change your specialty, mm-hmm. what would it be? Or would you change it at all? I don't think I would change it. I like, I like family medicine, but I don't know, maybe OB, mm-hmm. obstetrics and gynecology or surgery. I did really love, um, general surgery. I don't know. I, I, you know, I haven't really thought down that path because there's no way I'm doing another residency. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen, but I did love, um, surgery and procedures. Yeah. And, um, OB is, is a very cool field. So That's one of my favorite questions to ask. Being. Yeah. Because I never know, like, you know, I'll have a hematology oncology doctor and he's, then he says, you know what? I think I'd probably go into OB or (laughs) things that you would never think. Right. And so it's just very random, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, orthopedics wanting to switch it up and then they want to, you know, do family medicine or if they had to choose, if they had to go back, you know, Mm -hmm. in time and, and switch a different specialty. So, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I was fascinated with pretty much every branch of medicine. I really loved all of my rotations in one way or another, but there's something above and beyond about seeing, you know, brain surgery or open heart surgery, or just Mm -hmm. the OR is a very, very unique environment. Well, the cool thing that you don't normally see. (laughs) Yeah. And the cool thing, everything kind of starts with you with primary Mm -hmm. care. They come to you, right. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking at the condition and then you get the specialists involved. And so I think that's something special about primary care, which is so unique, is that it really starts, I mean, yeah, it starts at the ER sometimes too, but a lot of times it's the primary care or the ER, or they go primary care and you say, okay, you need to go to the ER right now. But it starts with you guys looking at that and diagnosing it and seeing what specialists that need to get involved right away. Mm. Um, and so there's a big responsibility and, um, collaboration that's involved within your job. Mm. So that's they would only give us enough time to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) What advice would you give a resident or fellow that are looking into family medicine? Into family medicine. Um, I would advise that person to do a lot of shadowing in different sorts of environments and do it, you know, during operating hours when the clinic is actually open or whatever environment that you're you're thinking about working in. Because you really want to see what the workflow is like um, and what the timeline is like and then how much um, time is spent documenting the patient. You know, ask, ask, ask the person, you know, how, mm-hmm. how, how long are you charting at home at night or how much time are you actually really putting in and just get, get, get yourself a clear picture of what you're actually getting into. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I think that that's, that's probably the advice that I would give. If you could think about one, um, of, I'm sure you have many, one of your most interesting cases that you've had so far, is there any that you could share with us? I mean, we have interesting cases, but they're kind of sad at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. That's a tough question because as a physician, you go through so many and you see so many people and every individual is so different that, mm. you know, it's, it's, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I think my most interesting cases are the ones where the people come back and they're doing well and they're feeling good about where they're at and yeah. the relationship between, you know, themselves and whatever treatment plan they're on. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could tell you like gory details of gross and crazy things, but I don't know. Yeah. And at, mm-hmm. while you talk to me and looking at your smile and as you talk about family medicine, I can tell you love what you do. I do. Yeah. I, I had a, actually he was my advisor during my residency and he was a great, a great doctor. And he said once that the best definition of a family physician is someone who does what needs to be done in that community. So with a broad training, you can fill that niche. Mm -hmm. Like here, you know, in 
where I practice now, what we need is people who are treating substance use disorder and yeah. working with that patient population. That is what we need. If I was in a community where we really needed pediatric care, I, I would have the capacity to do that with my license. And so, so I like that. And, and also uh, transgender, like affirming that mm-hmm. branch of medicine is, is, in great need um, yeah. in the community that I'm at now. And I'm working towards getting more training in, in that capacity to be able to serve that patient population. Yeah. Um, but I do like that about family medicine is that um, I can cater my training to serve a wide variety of people depending on the needs of the population. So, yeah. so I like that. How's COVID doing in Washington right now? I don't really keep a tally on the numbers and the admissions and the ins and outs of what all is going on. Um, it seems, it seems tolerable, control. But, but I am not working day in and day out in the hospitals. You know, uh, I seeing that I heard a few weeks ago, I have um, a couple of friends who are nurses in the hospitals and that they were, you know, kind of like not doing elective surgeries and the hospitals were pretty full. People were pretty stressed okay. out and overwhelmed. But I don't know if that's the case now. That was yeah. a few weeks ago, last time I talked to someone. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and just giving us some insight on why you got into medicine and where you went to training and, um, you know, advice to med students that are thinking about going into family medicine, do you have any last words that you'd like to, to say to them um, just about what you do and, and why they should choose that specialty? I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of need and it's challenging because the system is so broken, but I am reassured because I do see a lot of fresh young faces who who are, they, they clearly know what they're getting into and they're excited about it. So I, I hope that, uh, that it becomes more sustainable and that people, you know, really find joy in family medicine because it, it is a beautiful thing. It's, <laughs> it's still a very broken system. right now. So, well. Yeah. That's what we keep hearing. And hopefully that gets turned around. (laughs) Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and it's good to get to know you. And yeah, uh, it was a fun thing to do. Thank you. Well, have a great rest of your day. It was good to meet you. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast could not be possible. If you would like to be a guest, go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.